relative motion, in this case, Albert and Henry, just for the sake of argument. At the exact place and time they pass each other, they observe a flash of light. A sphere of light expands outward from that point. Since each measures the speed of light relative to himself, each believes correctly that he is always at the center of that expanding sphere. Even though they themselves move farther and farther apart, How can two people, in different places, both be at the center of the same sphere? To confirm his perception, each sets up light detectors an equal distance apart. However, while Albert's detectors register the light arriving simultaneously, he believes the light strikes Henry's detectors at two different times. Meanwhile, Henry sees the same thing in reverse. They agree on the speed of light but they disagree on whether events happen simultaneously or at different times. This is not semantics, nor a petty debate. It means that time, as well as distance, has to be affected by motion. However, as profound as this was, the French mathematician Henri Poincaré objected to the limited nature of Lorentz's explanation. What was needed, he said, was a new fundamental law of physics, the principle of relativity, according to which the laws of physical phenomena should be the same, whether for an observer fixed or for an observer carried along in a uniform movement of translation. In other words, as Galileo had suggested, one state of uniform motion is as good as any other. After all, this idea was the basis of Galileo's reasoning and the law of inertia almost 300 years earlier. But Poincaré was suggesting that the idea of Galilean relativity should be generalized to include all physical phenomena, including light. For example, an observer could not determine whether he was in motion by measuring the speed of light since that speed is the same for all observers. And that meant age-old notions about time and space had to change. And though Poincaré himself shied away from examining the consequences, Lorentz developed the equations needed to show precisely how much rulers would have to contract and clocks would have to slow down when they were in motion. The essence of his reasoning can be seen with the aid of the simplest possible clock. Two mirrors a fixed distance apart. With a light beam bouncing back and forth between them. Each bounce of the beam is a tick or a tock of the timepiece. To Henry, his clock is stationary and altogether ordinary. But for Albert, that clock is moving. And between tick and tock, he sees the light beam trace a diagonal path, which means it's traveling a longer distance. But the speed of light is the same for all observers. So the light must take a longer time to travel the longer distance. Therefore, Albert believes the moving clock runs slow. But how slow? relativity of time 
is derived from the right triangle formed by the distances traveled. The Pythagorean theorem shows that the path of the moving light is longer than the distance between mirrors. By the factor 1 over the square root of 1 minus b squared over c squared. This factor occurs so often in relativity that it is given its own symbol, the Greek letter gamma. So to an observer at rest, a moving light clock seems to be running too slowly by the factor gamma. A ruler, or anything else in motion, also seems contracted by that same factor, and it's called the Fitzgerald contraction. For speeds much less than the speed of light, gamma isn't very large. For example, the Earth in its headlong dash around the sun is shortened by no more than the length of one blade of grass. As for speed on the earth, while Lorentz was busy developing his theory, the steam locomotive barrier of 100 miles per hour was broken. 